Hi, everyone. My name is Katrine Mikkel. Uh, I work for the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Before we get us started, I wanted to mention a few things. Captioning is available for this session. To turn on captions, you should find this option at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom toolbar. To see it, you may need to click on in that. Also, there will be an anonymous survey posted in the session as a QR code as a link in the chat. With that being said, I will just turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Katrine. Uh, so as most of you know, I hope, I am Diana Burley, Vice Provost for Research and Innovation here at AU. And I am delighted to, uh, to, to organize this session and engage in this discussion with you today. I know that AI and generative AI have been a topic of conversation around the university for, um, for quite some time, as it is across many universities. And we've been talking a lot about the use of AI by our students in the academic setting, in our classrooms. But today I want to turn the discussion a little bit uh, toward the research and to talk about some of the issues uh, issues that are concerning and also issues that provide us with uh, great opportunities in the research enterprise and, um, and get that started. So I am joined today by two very dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, who are going to also help us engage in this conversation. I will tell you, and, and let me just stop and ask Katrina if you could take the, take the uh, slide down and just let our faces be on. Um, my colleagues, represent two different areas of expertise, but both of them have done quite a, a lot of work in the space of technology, technology innovation, and they've done a lot of thought leadership about the use of generative AI. The way that we're gonna structure this session is I'm gonna introduce each of them. And when I introduce them, I will ask them to give a brief opening statement just to lay some topics out on the table. Uh, and then after they each go, I will just engage them with a couple of questions to begin the discussion. My hope is that as we are starting the conversation that you will also engage and put some questions or thoughts in the chat window and we can begin to address some of those. And then we'll talk about how where we go from here because our goal here is for this to be the opening of a conversation as opposed to the end. So with that, I'm gonna start with my colleague, Rhea Sears. Now, first of all, I think the most important thing to know is that Rhea is an alum of AU. She received her JD from WCL. And um, so we're very proud of her. So welcome home, Rhea. Um, Rhea is a 30 year veteran of the intelligence community, working in a variety of roles, um, including being the chief NSA liaison to the FBI, um, working across the IC and thinking and talking about the use of technology and innovation uh, in, in our intelligence community. She is currently an executive advisor at Teneo. She also teaches uh, adjunct at a couple of other universities. I won't mention their names, um, but we want to get her back in the classroom at AU. But Rhea has thought about these issues from a policy and legal perspective and a regulatory perspective. And so I wanted to give her an opportunity first to just give us some of her initial thoughts about generative AI in the research uh, process and the conduct of research. And so I'm going to turn it over to Rhea for a couple of minutes, and then we will introduce uh, our other distinguished guests, and then we'll engage in a discussion. So Rhea, thank you for being here, and, and over to you. Thank you, Diana. It's nice to be back. Um, so when I thought about this discussion, I thought about a session I led a few weeks ago with members of boards of director about the incorporation of AI into their network architectures, their cybersecurity for the most part. But I think there's some lessons there um, from the incorporation of AI into the private sector that I'd like to hopefully make relevant to the university and academic research realm. Um, and they really touch across any number of industries. So there seem to be, as I think you know by now, two polar reactions to the promise of AI tools, either a rush to these shiny new objects or complete risk aversion. 
So obviously neither is the correct approach, but we also have to ensure that the use of AI tools for research doesn't become what it has, it has become in private industry. And that is a huge compliance burden, um, necessitating a large number of resources for oversight of tools and use of the data that's produced by AI. And my concern is just like in cybersecurity, there's going to be a shifting or an accountability burden to the consumer, to the client, in other words, you or university research. And so until some of these legal and policy issues are resolved, there are still ways to avail ourselves of some really amazing tools. So I'm gonna throw out some basic questions to, to consider. The challenging issues we're talking about today, especially from a policy and legal perspective, arise from the way generative AI systems are trained, of course, but you still must consider both their inputs and their outputs. Um, that's where a lot of intellectual property and copyright issues arise. And there are a whole boatload of legal cases in the queue all over the courts and here and overseas that hopefully will give us more guidance, but we're still kind of in limbo there. And when we talk about input, we are talking about data collection, and that's where the privacy issues have arisen. And we are seeing the development of laws, um, such as the European AI regulation. And then of course, in the US, what we have, and the only nice way to put it is a patchwork of many laws on many different subjects that somehow turns this yet into another attorney counsel bonanza, to be honest. Um, and given that the tech is always going to outpace the ability to explicitly cover some of the potential harms to privacy and intellectual property, um, that means that you will need that interpretive help. But that really brings me to the number one problem plaguing software innovation, not just to AI, and that's the development of the tool without baking in security to start with and then playing catch up when a problem is discovered. So in the case of AI tools, not auditing for potential problems related to um, data bias, fairness, privacy, data protection, and intellectual property ownership are the key things. So we emphasize the ethical requirements of our research, but we're in danger of turning AI tools unleashed into the wild, so to speak, without appropriate audits prior to final development. And this should be part of what's reviewed before we use these tools. Again, the burden should be on the developers, especially the businesses that are producing these tools for profit. But how to do this while encouraging information, uh, innovation, that's something we're still working on. So what then becomes the dreaded compliance role for university research authorities and researchers? What's due diligence uh, on their part in reviewing such tools? Uh, for example, should we have to examine the robustness of the technology provider, whether they're gonna be around in two years or capable of doing their own due diligence in updating tool inputs? Um, do we have to look at whether the tech provider can protect their own product from the poisoning of inputs? Um, is it possible to develop a roadmap based on the role of the researcher, the objectives of using the AI tool and the immediate or potential uses of the research? Again, I'm throwing out questions I don't have all the answers to, but I think that those are some of the things we're going to need to contemplate. It's the first thing that happens in this situation, of course, is a policy or a rule. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of universities and research programs that have already endeavored to set out the basics regarding the use of AI in research and what are acceptable use. Um, there are guidelines from funders, as many of you may have seen, on grant preparation. This is going to be a challenging job for university general counsels. Um, but I'd also like to see focus setting up a process that ensures that due diligence that I spoke of earlier that tests and assesses tools at different stages and provides guidance and test cases for their use. The linchpin is gonna be how much oversight is really possible at the university level. And this will um, revolve on the potential uses of the research, of course. So there's one last thing, and it's the real positive lesson I've taken from this, from the uses of cyber, but also from academia 
And it's probably, it's the reason you're all involved in the conference. AI will succeed, um, including in terms of identifying and remediating potential risk if we take an interdisciplinary approach to it from the research perspective. So I'm talking about, I guess, what some people now call engineering serendipity, this research that suggests that AI has the potential for boosting and supporting interdisciplinary functions. Studies have shown that AI can actually match make researchers across disciplines and provide some very significant ideas for research as well as prioritizing that reach research. So to me, that interdisciplinary potential can also guide AI's use and impact. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and you raised a number of different issues that I know um, Faye is going to, to jump on and, and certainly that I'll want to, to circle back and, and ask you about. And, and one of those that just want you to start thinking about while I introduce Faye is, we have a lot of faculty researchers on campus who do work internationally. And, and so I wonder if you can just maybe even talk about the approach that we ought to be taking as we think through um, these challenges and, and the, the patchwork, um, as you say, of, of regulations and, and policies that exist or that may exist sometime in the future. But before we do that, I want to introduce uh, our next uh, thought leader, and that is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Faye Cobb-Payton. Faye is currently a visiting scholar and advisor to the Chancellor of uh, Rutgers, and she advises on inclusive innovation. Uh, Faye has been a professor. She is actually a, a professor emerita from North Carolina State, and she also has been a program director and continues to be a special advisor at the National Science Foundation. And recently, I think it was just, what, two weeks ago, Faye, that oh. she was um, at Brookings Institute and talking, oh. about, uh, talking about ethics and AI and talking about the um, inclusive participation, particularly of Black women in generative AI and, and those kinds of, of discussions. So, Faye, I'm going to turn it over to you to give an opening statement and just throw some topics out on the table for us to think about. Sure, and thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me, Diana. Um, I have a hard act to follow here, but um, I will say and start with this. Um, I will lead with the conversation on the model, right? And, and the, where we left off, where you left off with compliance and, and the burden of um, use of tool. I would like for us to think about this, particularly when it comes to AI and biases, if we think about it in terms of four pillars. One is the fairness that is associated with the model or not, and testing for that. One is the accuracy of the model um, and testing for that or not. One is the equity that is built into the model as we're developing or not. And lastly, the transparency. Now, while we start from the premise of building these platforms, the biases that are talked about began long before a tool is constructed. And that is, what are even the developmental tools like in a discipline like mine, which is information technology, computing, where do the models of inclusive or exclusionary begin? What types of data sources? And I think particularly in the research enterprise, what types of data sources will be used? And what are the sources of those data sources? I give this example um, from a very practical project that I was working on um, with a group of researchers. And you find that yes, you, you are able to get to data, but is that data representative of the population, of the subject matter, of whatever phenomena you are looking to explore and investigate? So think about this in terms of a life cycle. Solving a problem using AI, generative AI, should be a life cycle phenomenon from the time that you ask the question 
that you as researchers are going to solve in the enterprise, who's in the room and who's not, all the way to where is human intervention in the experience, not necessarily in the loop. So I do agree that at each point, there should be some testing for truth so that you do not get all the way to the end of the process with a solution, recommendation, and sometimes implementation. You don't get to that end point without having some level of, we call it a feedback loop throughout the process. So I think that is very important. The idea of data um, bias, there are other sorts of data, there are other sorts of biases that are built, and I think we can certainly talk about those. But I do want to say this in terms of higher education and the research enterprise, particularly when we're thinking about robust data sources, sourcing those data sources, and even who is curating those data sources now have become a big question that must be answered uh, in this space. So one of the things is robust data sources. And from uh, an institutional perspective, what kind of analytics are you doing? What are the questions? Oftentimes I see that the wrong questions are being asked. So what is the question? What is the problem that is trying, that one is trying to solve? So going back now to what I heard about interdisciplinary. I've always said there's no way, and particularly in the classroom, I know we're not talking about the classroom at this point, but this requires, you know, sort of a culmination of all types of disciplines. This AI is not owned by engineering. It's not owned by computer science, though many would like to believe that. It's not owned by statisticians. There is room for the humanities and I tell you, by golly, with large language models, if you're not talking to your linguistics and your, your, your language uh, talent on campus, one has to wonder, right? Um, lastly, what I say is AI models thrive on and are more successful with large language, big data. Big data, big data, big data. I recently published a piece in Scientific American that really asks the question about context. That context gets to where's the small data? Small data does matter when paired with your solutioning. And lastly, I will say it is about who is involved in the process, which goes back to Diana, your question about the work um, and the presentation at Brookings, because traditionally we have not been at the table. And when there are solutions that involve a, a demographic without understanding fully that demographic, then you have a problem. There's a bias problem. And that is not a technical problem. That is a talent, inclusion, equity problem in this. And lastly, I will say one of the um, points that we used to tee up that conversation at Brookings was, you know, the New York Times came out with its list of what the future of AI looks like. And I challenge everyone here to go find that article and look at those faces. And that hasn't changed very much in terms of who's included in finding solutions to some very interesting interdisciplinary broad perspectives on things like climate and health and education and on and on and on. So I'll leave it at that, Diane, mm -hmm. and looking forward to the discussion that we're going Thank to have. You. Thank you. And, and, you know, if we think about your comments and Rhea's comments co combined, they paint a very, very complex picture. And so I do want to go back to Rhea about this, this question of what is, the, what is the approach that we need to take related to regulation uh, and policy and privacy. But I wanna do that in the context of, of Faye's comments about 
who is included in the development of the model and who is who is um, determining what data is used to train these models. Um, because in many instances, the researchers don't necessarily have control over the entirety of that process, right? And so, so when we get to the question of, of regulation and responsibility and accountability to, um, to the research, how do we begin to approach this knowing that um, we may be using a model, we may not necessarily have control over it, or we may be um, using data that has been the output, right, or the input. And so how should we even begin to approach from a research enterprise um, perspective, how, where do we begin, right? If you're just a researcher, where do you begin? Or if you're the VPR, where do you begin? And how do we begin developing um, not just policies at the university, but guidance for our researchers um, as they begin to, to leverage these tools a bit more? And so, I mean, I'll go back to Rhea and then the same question to you, Faye, because I think that okay. This this dovetails together, and I and I will say before Rhea, before you jump in, just Sarah, I see your question, and I think that this ties to um to to part of the question that you put into the chat. So uh, I think this will address all of those, and and encouraging others to go ahead and and add questions to the chat as well. So Rhea, to you. So this is kind of like the making of sausage, you know the mm -hmm. the input in particular, um and what the company who's putting together the tool decides to put into it. And I don't think, and this is one of Faye's great points that we ask enough questions about how they're determining what they put in. Um, and I'm afraid, and I'm saying this, because you gotta ask the question, are they doing it for, uh, are they including um, works, uh, academic works and other works where they won't think they'll be sued? And I'm sorry to put it that way, but I'm afraid that lawyers have their hot, and I'm one of them, hot little fingers all over it. Um, so I, I think you have to ask critical questions about what your input is, how you developed it. Did you use a panel of experts? Who were that? Who was that panel of experts? Because, you know, this reminds me a little bit of uh, what we experienced in cybersecurity too, Diane, <laughs> where we saw panel after panel after panel of the exact same people of all you know, their skills, their demographics, their backgrounds. Um, and people finally started asking questions about it. And, mm -hmm. and I think you have to force that discussion. And by the way, you're a market. You're a market that they want to sell to very badly. I can tell you that from dealing with some of the AI product producers. Oh, and yes. so you have the right to ask those questions. And you also, um, I, I think you have the right to, to run test cases for which you've already done some research and you can tell if there might've been omissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would add to what are your use cases? You know, you th that should be something that you define, discuss with the, the vendor of choosing Right. I think that's important. But I also think that, that as we were talking, I wrote down a couple of things. And that is, what is the institutional culture for this level of exploration? Right. Because, you know, at a university like yours and others, what are some of the concerns? It might be that you be and you probably won't be surprised that there are academic institutions that have the same concerns. How can you cross pollinate to mitigate those concerns, to come up with um, ideas, frameworks, uh, different ways of approaching uh, the problems? And then thinking about beyond chat GPT, right? Like what's, what's downstream? And I often say that, um, <clears throat> Each institution, while they may have similar problems, but you may have unique needs. And what are your unique needs in terms of the research enterprise, in terms of the student populations that you serve, in terms of your strategic? And I really, Diana, want to really focus on this for a minute. It is beyond just the operational day-to-day, -day, like 
strategically, what does AI mean for the enterprise and how does the culture of the institution align or misalign with what yeah. is going on in the space? Let, let's let's pull that thread a, a bit more, Faye, um, because I, I think, so one of the things that we have at AU, which you may not be aware of, is we have a, an emphasis on inclusive excellence, right? We have an entire okay. plan. We have a lot of strategic work that's being done around inclusive excellence. And so in the context of the models and AI and research, and you mentioned in, in the beginning and you're opening these four fairness and equity and right, I mean, and, and transparency. And so, mm -hmm. so in, in that context, as we think about again, you know, the answers aren't here yet, but the approaches are where we are trying to, to get a foothold. So as we begin to approach this from, um, from this inclusive excellence type of, of culture and perspective at the university, how do we begin? What, what, what should we be thinking about? And, and what questions should we be raising? You've mentioned some, but, but let's pull that thread a bit more. And how do we ensure that, um, and this is something that I, I do want us to get to as we look across the disciplines, because there are different needs and different ways of using these models. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if we can weave that in as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a loaded question. But um, what I will say, where do you begin? I happen to believe and I've seen cases where Ideas around implementation of AI in the academic setting, particularly for research, begin with an interdisciplinary conversation, right? I mean, what kinds of questions are you trying to answer? What type of questions are you answering in the library? What kind of questions are you answering in political science? What kind of questions are on and on and on by discipline, right? And I think re-elevating this may seem like a very trivial process, but I think it is really important. Elevating all disciplines so that discipline elitism does not take over the conversation. Because this is not one department or one college's or one school's problem. This is everyone's problem. So finding value and elevating that value from a very strategic, I sort of liken it to what we do in industrial engineering is what's your current state? What's your future state? And what are the gaps in between? And finding out what those gaps are in between to get you to that future state, hoping that it will align. I'm thinking with your strategic plan and your strategic think will be really important in this process as a starting point of where you begin, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That, that, that makes perfect sense. Priya, I'm struck and I want to hear your thoughts on this question as well, but I'm, I'm also struck. And of course, and Faye works in cyber as well. So, you know, anytime you, you mention cyber as this, we seem to be struggling with similar issues. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you might think about an, an, an analogous situation or something that you can pull from that space being a little bit further down the road. Um, and thinking about how we begin to approach some of these issues, um, whether it's related to the context or the culture of the university or the, the bringing together of disciplines, we certainly see that in, in the cyberspace, uh, or, or just other thoughts on, on how we can begin to approach this conversation. Well, I'd like to say we're farther along in cybersecurity on some things, but I'm not 100% <laughs> convinced. <laughs> Um, it doesn't mean we haven't thought longer. about it. I, I really think the struggle has been um, most recently, you know, it's all about the shiny objects, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everybody loves the new toys. Uh, and the new toys are great, by the way. They're absolutely great. You should try them. But nobody thinks about where they fit in the architecture. And this goes back to a lot of what Faye was saying. You know, I said something about a roadmap. There, there's just no thought about how it fits into your architecture, at what points, um, where is the consulting occurring among different people about potential strengths or weaknesses or gaps. Um, 
where I see that be successful, and I worked a little in the financial sector, and so again, that's very almost myopic because you're you're worried solely about you know let's be honest, money. Um, but it's when you sh you shine a light on that stuff and you look at how it fits in your existing structure and it doesn't become um, the monster that ate everything else. I and mean, one of the things I worry about is that we become so enamored at a tool that can speed things up for us, no question about it, that it takes over from everything else. Yeah. And, and that's the balance that I still think we're looking at in cyber that I... You know, everybody wants that magic thing. You hit the button and it tells you exactly where your threat is. That's what goes on in cyber. And mm -hmm. the reality is it takes a lot more thinking to understand where your real threats and vulnerabilities come from. I hope that helps. I mean, that's how I look at it from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There, 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 there is something, and I, 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 this might be a, a slight deviation from the question that you're discussing, but I'm looking at the chat. And I think um, answering uh, the two, this question around uh, this interdisciplinary approach and scholars have seen that, right? And seen attempts that non-traditional approaches in higher education. And I will say this, and this is something that we often say um, at the American Council on Education, is that this really is a moment if AI is going to be a part of the DNA of the organization, that it does require some degree of change management. What I think about, and I know this is not the discussion, but as a emerita, it, it re and I've seen plenty of these interdisciplinary sort of efforts, the institution should be if you're going to have an AI strategy or thread within your organization, the institution should be bound to actually reward those kinds of efforts because interdisciplinary research, personal experience, professional experience is difficult, it's hard, and it is often unrewarded because, and I'll say this, Academic institutions te tend to be siloed and AI has the potential to even force even more siloed environments. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a conversation for campus leadership, understanding faculty, tenure promotion, funding lines, what have you, that's going to be really important, Diane. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it follows along. So we've been having a conversation on campus around um, looking at promotion and tenure requirements, right? And, and thinking about them in a broader way and looking at more than um, what the traditional measures of productivity and excellence are. And so this, this conversation around AI fits very squarely in that space. You touched on something and I, I wanna take the term that Rhea used, which is the new shiny, right? The new shiny, the new shiny. object. And so I want you to, to take a moment and put your NSF hat on mm -hmm. um, because often what we see and what our faculty members see is um, solicitations and calls for proposals that are on the new shiny, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and and as you say, we can go, we being the, the, the collective, in, in two different directions. We can either double down on our siloed structure and what new shiny proposals, funding proposals in very um, tight disciplinary silos, mm -hmm. or we can go the other direction and, and mm -hmm. look for um, interdisciplinary work. And so from your NSF perspective, I wonder if you could talk not just about NSF, but what, what you're seeing in the, land, in the funding landscape surrounding uh, the use of AI in research. Yeah. So, you know, um, the first thing I'll say is, uh, since we are being recorded, these are my opinions. I, so I have to get that out there. These are my opinions. I am not representing NSF in this context. But what I will say is, you know, where uh, generative AI will play in the review process has clearly been articulated publicly by the current director, right? Um, and that is that the review process is and has been one that has proven to be rigorous 
without generative AI or generative tools. That's the first thing. Second thing I'd say, what am I seeing in the funding landscape? I had the opportunity to sort of work across agencies. There is more interdisciplinary at play, even in your core narrow um, subject matter domains, Diana. So, so even if it's not an interdisciplinary question, they're looking for interdisciplinary teams to address a question. So you're seeing more and more of that kind of um, collaboration that is being sought after. The challenge is um, getting those reviewed because you need someone that's going to be open-minded to those kinds of processes, those that kind of working environment. And lastly, I will say an observation about this is seeing that not all institutional types will be the same in those funding mechanisms, right? So everybody doesn't have to be an AU, a GW, um, a Georgetown. You, you might need to collaborate with minority serving institutions, HBCUs, in order to bring perspective to some of these problems that are being sought after as a result. Yeah, I think that that goes again toward the inclusivity piece. Exactly. Right? exactly. And, and bringing in different voices to um, to move research forward. I want to I, I want to turn to Ria and I want to turn to Ria about the question that Carl put in the chat um, because it's it's about the negative ways of thinking about how AI and the biases in AI could potentially harm the way that you know that that we as and I say I say we as academicians, as a researcher, as a faculty member, are being assessed and evaluated. And so I wonder if you could speak to that from um, from your perspective, Ria, and then Faye, certainly if you have thoughts on that. Sure. Um, it's funny because they're selling the products in this way. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the producers of AI tools, they're saying you can produce, your production is going to go up, you know, you've, you've become widgets here. Um, and that hit me when I was looking at some of the literature. Um, I don't, I, I admit to not being deep into academia other than teaching. Um, so I think it becomes a question, not just your use of AI tools helping you, um, produce more, but really what subject matter you're focusing on that is independent of the AI tools, meaning how are you able to become more innovative in your own research and not be completely reliant on tools? I have a hard time with this personally because, you know, I came, I come from an era where we actually went to the library and touched things which I miss. I remember going to the library and actually looking at, just looking at books. The fun, the thing that's most fun to me about teaching, I, is, is the syllab, is putting the syllabus together and looking for things I've never found before, because I haven't seen some of those authors before. And that's what I'm worried about here. And I think universities are going to have to address this almost as, um, I call it an HR problem, but it's a resource problem in how uh, how they evaluate people. That mm -hmm. it's not going to just be the production of of um, research, but also the thought process that's going into the direction of some of the research. And I don't honestly know how we do that. To you know, I think people are just like they're drawn to shiny objects. They're also drawn to volume. Um, but I can tell you that outside of the academic industry, I have seen um, people who produce a lot based on using AI and other instruments and have not succeeded because their research doesn't answer the burning questions that need to be answered. So there's still a huge piece of this of human intelligence. And I think your question kind of stands as a caution to academic institutions. And I know that doesn't answer it per se, but no, that's yeah. Okay. I, I'm curious, what what is Carl's discipline? 
I'm a political scientist. Um, oh, I'm an there you are, Carl. Okay. All right. And uh, and I'm listening carefully to your comments on interdisciplinarity because I just published something with a psychologist, a sociologist, and an economist. Yeah. So so I have very strong feelings about the question that you ask because um, when the way I read your question is. If I look you up on Google Scholar, what would your H index be? That's how I took it, right? And I do know in P and T cases where you can drive the impact number up, there are ways for which, as you know, researchers have gained the system, right? And it's less about volume and what is the perceived impact based on that H index or that R2 in blah, blah, blah platform. We'll just say that. So I do think that um, I can tell you personally that I, when this approach came around, there was a lot of work done around altrometrics. And those altrometric articles that were published in the Chronicle of Higher Education that talked about other ways that work can be impactful other than a citation index. And I think it becomes, I believe, the AI puts more burden on the scholar to demonstrate his or her impact, depending on what problem you're trying to address at your university. And I'm going to say that problem or that case may be promotion. Just as a, for example, um, I also do know that it is important for, um, for researchers to keep on par their personal research pages, right? To make sure that you show the work, show the impact. And so I think in terms of visibility, in terms of productivity, in terms of citation, these are the things that will you will have to show, and I relied quite a bit on my discipline. What is best practice in my discipline? And actually had to have those conversations with our leaders in the discipline, right? So yeah, there's Web of Scholar, Google Scholar. Um, so missing citations, definitely a big issue. You have to curate. You have to self-curate. That's what I did. I, I mean, that that opens up many different uh, topics that we obviously won't have time to go into today. But so in this context of altmetrics and, and thinking about how do we as individual scholars find the time to curate, yep. right? How do we think about the the potential discrepancies between the way our our current institution is looking at productivity and our discipline looks at productivity, right? And, and making sure that we're reconciling across those. Uh, and so I, I do want to continue that discussion, but I wanna raise one other, one other topic before we run out of time. And that is turning back to re-imagined students, right? And I know that this is a conversation around research and not around teaching, but we teach our students how to conduct research, right? That's right. And, and we certainly engage, and I know that um, even something which, which has been around for a very long time is looking at IRB and when do student researchers need to think about you know, IRB and you know, regardless of the level. And, and so I wonder if you could, each of you could maybe give your thoughts on on engaging students in these types of conversations, not around their academic learning pursuits, but around learning about research and conducting research. How do we train them properly when we're still learning ourselves? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll chime in first here, if you don't mind. Um, I would say the first thing, particularly for the student researcher, I'm gonna go all the way down to the undergraduate level. You know, research experiences for undergrads um, uh, and student researchers in general, I think this is a continual process. I don't see this as a point in time like you will do with the IRB process, right? You get the city, 
is I think that's what it's called, like certification and then check mark, you're done. I think this is a conversation that must happen on an ongoing basis and throughout the problem solving process. At each point, as we as researchers are learning, we must impart that to the student scholars. I call I always call them scholars because I'm hopeful that they will come and take our places, you know, at some point for the next generation. Um, so I think it is important that it is ongoing, it is iterative, and I think it's something that the students can also bring into experience, uh, bring their experiences to the table as well when it comes to some of the research questions that may come up, particularly from an ethical perspective, fairness perspective, um, even a justice perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is ongoing. I think it should start early and I think it should happen often. It is not a one year check and you're done. Yeah, yeah. Rhea, what are your thoughts on uh, that? So I'm teaching right now and um, I decided to subject myself to the same thing the students do. So I ran four paper topics um, through ChatGPT and they're just about cyber incidents and every one of them was inaccurate in way shape or form and and that's because the the input hasn't caught up with all the information out there that's basically a good lesson i don't want to discourage my students though from using artificial intelligence that would be terrible but i'm going to say something that's based on my experience in national security policy making as opposed to um other types and that is i don't understand how anyone can really begin to function in the ai environment in terms of doing queries until they mm. master the basics of critical thinking mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. i'm a liberal arts person i admit it and and i don't think just a liberal arts thing and i think until we in, can inculcate that and we do that undergraduate and even in high school Mm -hmm. we're going to be left behind a little on this and it is mm -hmm. all about the queries for them at the moment um but also challenge them to find other ways to find the information through ai sources which i've done and, and learned about some really interesting things as a result to be honest um yeah. but it's about how you parse out these issues as well um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think that i think that's the perfect ending statement it's about critical thinking um, yes, it is. So yes. we are we are almost out of time, and I want to make sure that I have a moment to to make an announcement, and that is, uh, first thanking you both, both of you, for your participation and for um your insightful comments, and to let our faculty know that this is not the last time you will have the opportunity to engage with um with Faye and Ria. They have both agreed to join us this spring for some additional discussion. We're gonna schedule two in-person luncheon discussions featuring them as, as thought leaders to help us to continue to explore some of these questions. And so if you have particular ideas that you would like us to follow up on, um, please let me know. You can send us an email at the VPR, uh, VPR at American.edu um, message. You can include it in the survey for the session. Um, but we will be scheduling those probably sometime in, in Mar for March and April, and um, hope that you will be able to join us as we continue this discussion. So with that, I am going to thank you all. I want to make sure that we end on time because I know there is another session following this one. But thank you all for coming, and um, thank you especially again, Faye and Rian. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, thank everyone. You.